Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure we'll have some more folks trickle in. I do know that we have a lot of our normal attendees actually on our panel today, uh, so that's encouraging. We're going to have a really lively discussion, and uh, we're really excited about that. But first of all, we just want to welcome you, and thank you so much for joining us for another installment of our research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of MVU, or the Michigan Virtual University, a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. MVU also provides student learning services for K-12 students through the Michigan Virtual School, as well as professional development opportunities in blended and online learning through its Professional Learning Services Division. You can be sure to check us out at MIVU.org to learn more about the parent company of MVLRI. Just a quick disclaimer before we get started today, this webinar will be recorded and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during this webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views, opinions, conclusions, and other information which do not necessarily reflect those of MVU and or the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute and are not given, <coughs> excuse me, nor endorsed by MVU slash MVLRI unless otherwise specified. I think we're going to have a nice and candid conversation today, so maybe this disclaimer is pretty appropriate for today's discussion. So I'm going to turn it over to our lead provocateur, Ray Rose from Rose and Smith Associates, uh, and he will be introducing our presenters. So thank you, Ray. Well, this is going to be an uh, interesting situation because we, right now it looks like we've only got four people, and this will make it very interactive. Um, I had suggested this topic because the people that are presenting are, number one, all people who have been involved with journal writing, and, uh, journal writing, journal reviews, and so just, and we have talked at various times about what people are doing and what the submissions that we're seeing. So the focus here is to have a discussion. I'm going to just have each person introduce themselves briefly and then if you folks, participants, do not ask questions. I will be asking questions, but if you can use the chat um, window to ask questions to make sure that the things that you are concerned about relative to journal articles um, are addressed. So let's go down the list and we'll start with um, Leanna. I've got a clock timer here. You've got only a minute to introduce yourself and give folks a little sense of what your experience is and things you care about. Okay, thanks Ray. My name is Leanna Arshambo and I'm an associate professor at Arizona State University. Um, and in this context, I'm um, co-editor with Dr. Catherine Kennedy of the Journal of Online Learning Research, which is focused on K-12 online education. And um, so I've been publishing since being in the master's program back in 2002-ish. Um, and so a big part of what I do as an associate professor is um, submitting and uh, publishing research, but I'm also on the editorial side, so now I've gotten more into reviewing and um, putting together uh, editions of our journal. So just a little bit of background about me. Hope that was less than a minute. Funny thing, it was. Very good. <laughs> now you've set the model for everybody else. Um, Michael, you want to do a little intro? Sure. I'm Michael Barber. I'm at uh, Toro University, California, out in Vallejo, although uh, it's a recent move. Um, I was formerly at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut. Um, like Leanne, I started publishing in my master's days, I think back in 99 or 2000. Um, I've currently reviewed for about a dozen different journals and have since uh, the early 2000s, and I've guest edited several uh, issues actually several with folks that are actually in the room so which has been a fun experience
Okay, nice. We're all doing a good job getting things um, within the minute. Jared, don't mess it up. It's up to you there. <laughs> all right, I'll do my best. Um, so I'm Jared Warp. I'm at George Mason University, which is about 30 minutes outside of D.C., um, and I'm in my fourth year here, so I'm, I'm probably a little more green than everybody else on the on the panel. Um, I got my PhD, and when I did, uh, it was a three-article dissertation format. So that's when I started publishing. Was um, a little before my dissertation, then my dissertation articles, and then uh, like Lana, and, uh, it's a big part of my job now. So. Um, I've also guest reviewed for about 10 journals. I find that new PhDs get asked a lot to guest review, and so I started saying yes to everybody, and then I started saying no later on. Um, I've also been an editorial review board for a couple of journals, and uh, right now I'm, I'm working with uh, Dennis Beck and Lisa waters on a special issue that should be coming out next month for the Journal of Online Learning Research. Very good. Just add a minute. Okay, Susan, last last one. You're doing the intro. Um, I'm Susan Rose. I'm at the Institute for Learning Technologies at Teachers College, Columbia, and an adjunct professor learning technology. Um, pretty much like everybody else, I've been publishing for a while. I've been a journalist. I read AERA papers. Uh, I'm a qualitative researcher who's been doing a bit of quantitative research, so kind of data mining stuff. And I teach a course um, at Teachers College on online schools and online schooling for K-12. So. I pick up a lot of ideas by doing okay. Thank you, Susan. Susan, your audio was a little weak, uh, so you're going to need to see about fixing that on the uh, next shot around. So we've got just four participants at the moment. Um, <clears throat> show of hands have our you thinking about planning on submitting journal articles? Any of you? Oh, at least one of you is. Okay. So, Christopher, um, if you've got specific questions, um, that's something to be thinking about what are the questions um, as we go along. Just jump in. And Randy, you're saying not much right now, but maybe um, we can encourage you to think about doing um, a topic in the future. Um, OK, I'm going to start off with um, just a question, and let's start with Susan and work back through the group here. Um, what is one topic that you would like to see more articles, more research on? Wow. Uh, why don't you Uh, uh, let's pass it to Jared, Jared, and then you can come back at the end, okay? <laughs> Jared, sure. you have... Uh... I think it's so wide open. I think there's so many need in so many different directions. I do think I'd like to hear a bit from students. You'd like to hear a bit from students, did you say? Yeah, a bit more than Okay. Cool. Jared? Yeah, so I, I think right now in the field um, we've been fairly exploratory in our research, and, and that makes sense uh, for, for where we're at. Um, although I, I, I do feel like we're at a point right now where we could start 
uh, creating more instruments and validating more instruments um, that could be used in the field, not only by researchers, but by practitioners, kind of measure effectiveness of online environments. Um, there's a, there are really good chapters on kind of the state of the field that I point people to. So in, in the handbook, there, there's a nice uh, chapter. Uh, there's another chapter in a book that uh, Michael Barber uh, co-edited on online blended and distance education in schools. And what I like about that chapter is it, is it basically says that for a long time, uh, the research was basically asking, does um, online learning work in comparison to face-to-face -face and really having these horse race type studies and comparing them? Um, and they make a strong argument saying, we, we need to get past that type of research. Instead of asking, does, it, does online learning work in comparison to face-to-face, -to -face, we should really be asking, um, what types of online learning or what types of online teaching strategies or support strategies work in an online environment. So, um, and, and I think that we've done a lot of that type of research as well and we definitely need more of that. Cool, good. And I know, Michael, you've got opinions on this one. <laughs> Actually, well, to pick up on something that Jared did say, um, this idea of validated instruments, I mean, <laughs> Jared made the comment about how where we are in the field right now is sort of typical for where we should be, you know, a lot of sort of the foundational work. But, you know, if you think about it, the, the field is 20 years old now. And there has been a lot written. Um, I just did a quick look at an article that Tom Clark, Kathy Kavanaugh, and I did back in 2009 where we looked at just the open access literature and we were able to identify over 500 pieces that uh, we could pull in there. Um, so at some point we sort of have to move past this foundational work and get into some of the more substantive stuff uh, like doing things that uh, you know are based upon validated instruments and within the general field of distance education you know there's a lot of those instruments available uh, many of them would likely need to be tweaked for the k-12 environment but that work really hasn't begun uh, the vast majority of work that we've seen in the field has tended to be a theoretical. You know, very few of us, and I'm just to, as well to blame as this as, as everyone else. Um, you know, are using sort of a theoretical or conceptual frameworks to to guide our research, and um, you know, that's an area I think that, that we could be looking at as well. Um, but I I think we really do need to start to give serious consideration to what does a mature research field look like and how can we as researchers begin to contribute to that maturity? And I, I would just piggyback on that too, uh, Michael, where I think there's a lot of research being published and, and what I mean by research is it's not necessarily adding to the conversation or it's not um, acknowledging the work that's already been done. It's just kind of going through the process. We have these questions, here are our findings, and, and that's getting published and it's helpful. But I think we need to move to, to have more scholarship where it's a conversation where we're building on ideas, building on previous research. And there, there's a lot of that as well in the field, but, but we definitely need more. So if I could jump in here and piggyback off that since we're talking. One thing that's striking me is that people will make similar statements and cite an entirely different list of authorities. It's feeling like there's no sort of consensus about what the, or the leading articles are that you should be citing. Very little. I'm wondering if anybody else is getting that same sense.
Okay, now can you hear me, Leanna? You should be joining in here. Um, I had a... Are you? There we go, okay. So, Leanna, two things. You've got uh, Susan's question of um, citations and references, but you've got the bigger question of what do you want to see more of? Well, to answer Susan's question, yeah, I think um, we have to redirect. A lot of times, Catherine and I will get questions about people looking for literature in a particular area saying there's nothing that's been written on, um, for example, teacher preparation in K-12 online environments. And we have to um, give an annotated bibliography of, yes, there's actually material out there. Here's what you might want to look at. Um, so I don't know if it's a matter of, I'm, I'm glad that the Journal of Online Learning Research is open source. Um, through AACE, so folks can um, readily access those articles. Um, that's made it easy. Uh, sometimes, you know, people are behind or don't have access to a university library, so that makes it difficult. Um, but a lot of what we do is helping to connect the articles, seminal pieces, um, especially with doc students who might be searching for them and, and running up against difficulties finding um, the articles. Um, in terms of the original question, which is about areas that we'd like to see, um, I echo a lot of what Jared and, and Michael are, are sharing in terms of um, where we've gone and moving past the discussion of um, online versus face-to-face -face and trying to get beyond that. I think um, one of the things that we really look for is implementation models and who's having success, especially when it comes to student support or um, in pre preparation of teachers, who's doing it well, um, what are the lessons learned, um, what can be replicated across models. I think this, it's really difficult sometimes uh, for researchers to get their foot in the door of, um, you know, whatever type of, um, whether it's a cyber charter or a state virtual school, sometimes it's difficult to kind of get in there and see what's working um, because a lot of times there's also things that aren't working um, so people are hesitant to might be hesitant to have researchers in so I think if we can kind of um, as, as a field you know assure folks that we want to partner that we that we're not taking a deficit model but we're looking at what they're adding and how we can share what they're doing so that other programs can benefit the other area, I think, is working with um, online education with special populations or specific populations, so um, maybe students with special needs um, or, you know, looking at how does online education work for specific groups of students and how can we support those students who might have uh, unique situations and, and what works for them. I think I'd like to see more along those lines. Cool. Very nice. I'm going to pick up on something that I saw Michael um, in the chat line talking about and I'm going to, I think, play the provocateur role here. Um, Michael was talking about having something about future direction and my concern is that the organizations that should be helping to move the field have not done, this is my opinion, have not done a lot to help advance the existing um, programs. So where should things be going as opposed to helping people get started? And so, um, Michael, where are you looking at in terms of, what are you thinking about in terms of future? And then for the others, if you want to chime in on that. I'm not sure I understand the question exactly, Ray. Um, or at least how it was different from the last question. And okay. how you prefaced it, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer first. Well, okay, here's, here's, here's the playground. Um, and I'll be more explicit. Um, my big frustration with iNACL has been their focus on helping people get started and not moving the field, looking to take the existing programs and to move them to the, to another level. And I think that that is a problem with 
a lot of the issues and I can connect it with the things that Leanna talked about in terms of lack of information about how online connects with certain populations. But um, so that's that's the top, that's what I'm tossing out here. Well, if you really want me to start, I will. Um, I you've said it much nicer than what I would have said it, uh, Ray. I would have actually went out and and, and clearly said that INACL isn't interested in research. They are interested in increasing the level of practice. Um, and the biggest reason they aren't interested in research is because they really don't care what the research says. They have a particular agenda that they are um, pursuing and um, it came, became very clear that um, early on in the days of the research committee and the research SIG, which most of us in the room were involved with for the first three or four, even five years that it was actually active, and now um, very few of us, if any of us, are actively involved in the organization anymore because they are pushing an ideological agenda that doesn't match up with what we know from the research and that is their big problem. They just, you know, they like to put themselves out there as the ISTE of the online blended and competency-based learning world, but the fact of the matter is ISTE and these other organizations actually not just let research guide them, but actually um, foster that research community within them, whereas INACO has consistently and repeatedly um, ignored and gone contrary to what the research says in pursuit of these ideological goals. Okay, anybody else want to join in here? Or is this just going to be Michael and I? Nobody else is joining. I, okay. I, I can, I, I can say just a little bit on that. Go ahead, Jared. Go ahead, Leanna. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I don't, I mean, yeah, the INACL debate is uh, an ongoing one, and I think a lot of, as Michael mentioned, a lot of us have kind of just voted with our feet. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't see a heavy research conversation going on there, and that's one of the reasons why, and Catherine um, spearheaded uh, creating the Journal of Online Learning Research um, so that we could have a place that's not, um, I don't know what the right word would be, but there's no editorial control. I mean, we're certainly editors, but it's peer reviewed. Um, you know, it's based on the data. There's no overarching, the AAC is not an organization that's going to approve or not approve what we can um, publish there. So I think um, finding outlets that are open, I'm hoping that that way the conversation can happen um, organically and in an in a equitable manner rather than kind of dealing with the whole messiness of uh, what I may call represents. Okay, Jared, you want to jump in now? Yeah, I was just going to say that in the field it feels like there's a pretty big tension right now between efficiency and flexibility and effectiveness. Um, and kind of building 21st century skills and things like that. And so um, right now, e even in cyber charter schools, there isn't a lot of uh, collaboration going on um, in the courses. Uh, they, they tend to be more self-paced, especially in supplemental models. They tend to be more self-paced, um, which is there, there's a lot of advantages to that. Uh, but at the same time, um, it might not be the most effective in, in preparing students for, uh, or, or preparing them to, to gain the, the 21st century skills. So that's that's kind of a tension I, I feel, and I feel like INACOL is more focused on kind of the efficiency and competency-based or flexibility of online learning uh, where, where maybe we need to step back and look a little bit more at how do we develop communities, how do we, how do we make it the most e effective uh, learning environment possible. So you, two of you have mentioned some areas that there could be more research in, which was what I was pushing ultimately to get to here. 
um, but to tie it back to the journal review process and to maybe be a little bit helpful for some of the uh, participants here. And let's start with Leanna on this one. Um, thinking about all of the um, articles that you've reviewed, what are the things that you like to see in those submissions or you'd love to see? Leanna? Things I'd like to see in terms of like quality of the paper or topics or? Left it wide open. You respond to whatever connects for you. Well, I think um, one of the things that I like to see, uh, and I, you know, our, we're very wide open in terms of anything related to K-12 online or blended learning. So, um, you know, and, and um, that blended part is, is defined differently. Um, but um, that's one of the things we have to redirect a lot of different articles. They don't read the call necessarily for the focus, uh, for the scope of our journal. And so we have to redirect a lot of articles because it's not applicable to um, what JOLR is trying to, um, you know, the types of articles that we're trying to publish. So um, I like to see when an, when an author has really looked at the scope and looked at the call and it aligns well with um, the, the um, topics that we're, that we're publishing. And I like to see when authors are reading in our journal, even though we're relatively new, this is our um, going into our third year, so it's just that there's, uh, but there are previous editions, there's um, articles that are available, and so when they look at kind of the trajectory of what's been published, and they situate their work um, within the scholars here, many of us are, um, you know, have been in this field for um, quite a while in, since its infancy, and we're still in our infancy. Um, but I think that's another thing is trying to uh, make sure that an author has read, and not just our journal, but kind of the greater conversation. So like Jared said, that they're able to situate their work, and, um, you know, that they've found kind of a, a new line of research um, that they can participate in the conversation without, ha you know, while still giving credit and synthesizing uh, what's happened in the past, but kind of moving, in, even if it's just by inches, moving the field forward. A lot of times, you know, with, with literature reviews, um, authors haven't taken the time to carefully synthesize what existing research is out there. Cool. Okay, Michael? I think I mentioned it earlier, but probably I guess the, the, the biggest thing that bothers me when I do a review, and it was one of the points Jared made, is you can clearly tell that either the folks are largely ignorant of our field or have just been lazy in their writing, um, in that they are making claims that, you know, there's little research in the field and in particular in whatever specific aspect they are working on, uh, when in reality there, you know, there is. Um, the most common comment I make on my journal article reviews is actually suggesting specific literature that deals with, um, you know, I'll just throw out some topics, you know, parents in the full-time online environment or that looks at interaction. Uh, within a supplemental kind of classroom and um, you know those kinds of things are ones that um, you know I'm even just a, in all honesty a simple Google search uh, Google Scholar search would generate a lot of these um, citations folks would want to use so when I look at sort of a really good manuscript or a great manuscript as I see it coming in um, it's one where I don't automatically know things that they've missed right off the bat. Cool. Good. Thank you. Jared? Um, have you guys seen the movie Dumb and Dumber? 
it, it came out when I was in high school. I haven't seen the new one, so I've, I'm a little more mature now. But there, there's a scene in there where uh, one of the main characters, either Dumb or Dumber, I don't know which one, uh, walks up to a couple guys at a 7-Eleven drinking uh, a Big Gulp, and he just walks up to him and says, Big Gulps, huh? Well, see you later, and then just kind of walks off, right? And I, I think as, as a researcher, what we need to do is kind of stand on the side a little bit, listen to the conversation, see what's going on first, and then once you understand the conversation, then you can say, okay, I'm going to add my 20% or I'm going to add my, my little bit to that, right? Um, and I think too much of research is you just walk up, there's a conversation going, you have n no idea what the conversation is, and then you just say, big gulps, huh, and then walk away. Or you say, well, um, I, I looked at VoiceThread. I researched VoiceThread. This is what I found, and then walk away. So you never actually acknowledge what's been done, but not only that, at the end, with the discussion of an article, you need to talk about where the conversation should go what, and really highlight why your research is important. And I think that discussion part is the hardest to write, but it's also probably the most important thing to write. Um, the other thing that really is, can, can make it hard as a reviewer is the introduction. So in the introduction, what you're trying to do is argue for the importance of your, of your research, right? And too often, the only thing people say is, there hasn't been research done on X, therefore I'm going to research X. And just because there hasn't been research on it is not a rationale for doing the research, right? I mean, you have to tell us why it's important to do that. Um, I, I remember... Uh, with my dissertation, um, David Wiley, uh, some of you might be familiar with him, he was on my committee and, and he asked me the question, you know, I, I read the introduction, but where's the bleeding baby? You know, like, like why should I care about this? Give me a reason to, to care, to, to know why this is important to address. And I think that in that introduction, we can highlight, you know, are, are we saving blood and money by doing this research? I mean, why is it important to know these things? Um, and too often, we don't do that. We just say, well, it hasn't been done, therefore I'm going to do it. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I think we're picking up on the same, sort of the same theme as Leanne. Um, Susan. So, I agree with everything that's been said, um, particularly the notion that the whole goal is to move the field forward. To do that, you have to past research. And you're not just plunking a lot of articles synthesized down on the page. But the other things that I find a lot is that people do not explain their data thoroughly enough, and they do not explain their procedures thoroughly enough. Um, and that is really hard to do in a short space. And it's also the kind of having other people for you submit because you get so embedded in your material that you don't realize what's missing. So having somebody else can say, oh, there's a big gap here, or oh, where did you get this, where did this population come from, or whatever. Um, I find a lot, a lot of my not explain well. So we need to get better um, understanding. We need the people who are writing to have a better understanding of the field. And so do you think that part of the problem is that, and this does not apply to any of the institutions represented here, um, but that the faculty advisors, the faculty, don't have a good understanding of online education to begin with, and so cannot help to direct um, the authors of articles. And I'll just leave that open, see if anybody's willing to take a shot at it. Michael. I'll jump in at that, uh, Ray. Um, and that's actually a, an incredibly important point. 
Um, I don't know about my colleagues, but I know I regularly get asked to serve on committees from students that aren't at my institution. And um, I would say that for every time that I say yes, before the student actually gets to the final dissertation, um, I'm going to say four out of every five will have replaced me before they actually finish their dissertation. Um, largely in part because the people that they have locally know absolutely nothing about K-12 online learning and know very little about um, online learning in general. Like you say, they're really just sort of ignorant of it. And so the demands that I'm placing upon these students from other institutions are often seen as unreasonable or um, a high-minded, if you will, um, because the local folks aren't asking these things of them. And um, it, I'm always amazed when it happens, but uh, I shouldn't say that. I'm not surprised when it happens. I'm amazed at the number of times it does happen. Um, and I think a lot of that speaks to the fact that if you were to go into the ProQuest dissertation database right now and do a search for virtual school, cyber school, or K-12 online learning, or for that matter, blended learning in K-12, um, you would find literally hundreds of entries there just in the past three years. I know the last time I looked was about six to eight months ago, and there were over 900 dissertations listed in there that you could add up between those four terms. And, um, you know, we haven't had over 900 things published in the field in the last three years. So that means that there's a lot of work that's being done by students at the doctoral or for that matter, master's level that is in all honesty, absolute crap because their advisors, um, you know, just don't understand the field. Thank you. Anybody else want to get in on this one? I just want to echo that. Um, they don't understand what research in the field is like. They don't understand what the data is, um, understand the constraints, and so they can't um, save their students from making errors that should never be made in, in putting something into publication. I just want to add that I think one problem is a lack of fear. I spent a lot of time doing fairly descriptive studies. Uh, even those of us who are doing data analytics and stuff, it's been pretty descriptive. Um, and there isn't a big body of theory that we could be applying it to that part. You were fading out on the end there, Susan. Can you come back with that after your statement about lack of theory? No, maybe not. Susan is in the middle of a rainstorm and has been her system told her she didn't have internet connection, so uh, she <laughs> has been struggling with um, the technology a little bit here. And, uh, maybe Susan, the best thing to do would be to put it in the um, in the chat. Side, um, Leanne, do you have any? Leanne, do you have anything to add to this? Um, no, and I see uh, Michael's mentioned some of the theoretical pieces, and I do. Um, it is exciting to see Jared's the parental involvement, uh, the ACE framework, get out there and being used and implemented in different ways and applied to different settings. So, um, as well as the S free. And um, Catherine and I are serving on uh, an EDD dissertation, so it's a, it's a action research, but it's uh, here at ASU for a doctoral student who uh, is running a, a cyber charter school and um, using that instrument to help uh, design and support students uh, along the various 
um, constructs that it measures. So I think um, we do need more application of theory within the field and um, also for those of us who are more veteran um, to develop some of those measures and, and maybe it's something that's been in another field and can be applied to K-12 online learning. Um, but then also that we take the time to validate those measures as well. And um, I think that's a, an important contribution to the field. Okay, Leanne, I'm going to come back to you with a sort of a twist here because I know that you have also been reviewing um, presentation proposals for various conferences. And would you care to make a connection between um, presentation um, proposals and journal articles, either comparison, contrast, whatever. How do you see those two things working together or whatever? Okay. Um, well, I think for me personally and also for others, um, it, being at a conference is a great opportunity to connect with those uh, here and those in the field and find out, you know, what everyone's been working on. Um, a lot of times I'll start new things, new ideas, and get feedback, getting some initial feedback. So uh, I'm much more, I try to be more, um, I'd say, adventurous in trying something new at the conferences and getting, um, getting the kind of the uh, input of others before I'm like fully developing uh, a journal article. But I, I see conference proposals as a starting place never is uh, an ending point, you know? It's something that it gives me a deadline to work toward, and I encourage my doc students to do the same. So um, generally speaking, and, and the site conference is the one that I typically um, go to and have attended for a number of years. And, you know, it's pretty um, low stakes to put together a brief paper or, you know, a 15-minute uh, presentation. We've been, uh, last couple years, we've been putting panels together. So, um, you know, trying some new things within conference proposals uh, before I fully develop something for a journal. And with that regard, as a reviewer, I tend to be pretty open to, uh, as long as it's developed, you know, there's, uh, I think when I see something that's just like a paragraph, I can't, there's something I can do with that. That doesn't tell me enough. Uh, for, a, for a conference uh, presentation. So I, it needs to be developed, but it doesn't, you know, maybe it's a proposal, maybe there's not data yet, um, you know, it, maybe the author is trying something new. I think I tend to be much more favorable with the journal, uh, with, I'm sorry, with the um, conference proceedings review process uh, and much more stringent with the uh, journal article submission process. Cool. Good. Thank you. If I could jump in on this one, actually, there are sort of, when I was trained um, in my doc school, depending upon which faculty member I talked to, there were sort of two very distinctive thoughts about conferences and how to actually go about them. Um, the First was the one that Leanna outlined that, you know, it is a good way to take projects that um, really aren't at the stage where you're writing the manuscript yet, you're still playing with ideas, in some cases you're still collecting data, um, you know, so you're essentially testing out themes, trying to get feedback on the ideas that you're generating, those kind of things. Um, and, you know, that's a, uh, I think what many of us have done in the past, um, it, and to use site as a good example, because the full papers are eight pages long and the brief paper is six pages long, it's a good idea to, you know, basically get a start on a 15 to 20 page journal article by um, using your eight pages in site because you can do it single spaced and they actually specifically ask for 11 point font. So really it actually works out to being about a 12 to 15 page properly formatted uh, journal article. So it's a good sort of starting point to use as a way for jumping off into a journal manuscript. Uh, the other school of thought, and I had a couple of faculty members uh, when I was at Georgia that were adamant about this. Um, that uh, essentially you should wait until things are published 
before you actually go and present at conferences. Um, you know, so that essentially you are presenting something that someone could actually pull the full journal article on if they were interested in the 20 minutes that you just talked about it. Um, you know, so there, there is that sort of reverse option uh, that you have there. And, and I know in my own work, I've probably, half of my conference proposals have been things that I'm still playing with. The other half have been things that I've already completed and I'm just trying to get the word out about them now. Yeah, and if I could, can you hear me? Because one other yeah. thing, I find that um, there's nothing like putting together a six-page PowerPoint to make you clear about what you think. You can kind of obscure that in a 12-page paper, but having to hone it down, I've extremely good practice. Um, for both myself and for students as well. Good, good point. I have, I have to be honest and that I have not been paying close attention to the chat. Are there issues that have happened in the chat that we need to make sure we address? While, while you're looking at the chat window, I'll, I would just say that um, it's really important to find the right conference, and I'm still trying to fill that out. But it feels like, oh, um, site is really good for K-12 online learning, and when I present K-12 online learning research at ACT, like no one goes, right? So uh, finding the right fit for your research is, is just as important as, as anything else, I think. Thanks, Michael, for being there. Yeah, you were there. There, there was yeah. the, the so, There were actually some people, but normally that that's not the case. I think uh, Catherine might be about to say that uh, we went to OLC this year because they keep saying they want to do K twelve, and um, they just don't. Yeah, that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Now, OLC has a thread, right? A K-12 online and blended learning thread. Is that not going well? It's kind of uh, a very, very thin little thread at this point. Um, and, and I think I think that's why some of us miss iNACL, because at least, and, and I think why some of you are going to site, has switched over to site, because um, it, the thing with site, it's, it's so many other things in addition to being an academic. So we really don't have a good place. Maybe that's part of the field is not coalescing. So I'm going to throw Actually, I'm going to throw sticks. On that right. a second, Ray. Okay, um, Michael, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, OLC, when they uh, first um, started the K-12 track, they, because um, uh, uh, Anissa and I were running it at the time, it was actually in conjunction with the fact that they were doing a special issue focused on K-12. Um, but in all honesty, both sort of fizzled. If you go and look at that particular special issue that um, Anissa and I um, guest edited, you'll see over half of the actual volume is regular articles because we simply didn't generate enough interest from the call um, to even have a full issue of, of K-12 um, um, articles for that particular special issue. Uh, when the first year that they had the track, um, basically other than a, a high contingency of Michigan Virtual Learning folks that were there, and um, really myself and Anissa, that was pretty much the entire K-12 uh, track that year, and um, I know that there was some talks of Michigan Virtual taking it over, but the the fact of the matter was, um, I think they had hoped it being in Florida might attract a larger contingent of Florida Virtual School folks, but the pricing that they have for the particular conference, I think, is um, you know just puts it out of reach for many folks. Um, Susan is exactly right in that many of us 
um, you know, really enjoyed the fact that in the fall we could go to a practitioner-focused INACO conference, and then in the spring we could go to a more academic research-focused conference in site and still have two places where we had this virtual learning, uh, K-12 online and blended learning stuff going on. Um, the fact that INACO has really just shunned any uh, meaningful research has been a real disappointment and for whatever reason there is an online learning group within ISTE uh, but that really hasn't taken off even though that would be a, a nice place for us researchers to interact with the practitioner community but that hasn't happened either. Part of it I think might be the, the timing of the ISTE conference. So Coming back around, I'm going to throw a couple of sticks at site just to cause problems here. Um, I stopped going to site because I wasn't learning anything. I wasn't seeing anything new. I was seeing a bunch of grad students who were presenting research based on an N of 10 or 15. And I got a little bit frustrated. I loved seeing you guys there, but it just, this conference didn't help me a whole lot. Uh, I will be at South by Southwest EDU this year, which is happening concurrently with SITE. And so I will catch up with some of you in Austin at a, in a slightly different way. Um, South by Southwest EDU is not a good place for research, but it's a good place for new things, for thinking about new things. I'd like to also suggest a couple of other things. Um, National Distance Learning Association has a conference. It is not terribly research focused. They're struggling with K-12, as is my local version, Texas Distance Learning Association. We are looking to find more uh, involvement, though, in K-12, and TXDLA is putting together a journal, an online journal, so that that's another place to think about um, conference uh, uh, publications, places to publish. Um, and then I'm going to mention Quality Matters uh, just as another conference. And again, they're not doing a whole lot with the research, but they claim to be research oriented. They are clearly, their history is higher education, but they are moving into K-12. Um, and if you've been paying attention to K-12 stuff with QM has been trying to connect with the INACO group to make things um, connected. But I think ISTE has potential with new leadership there that it may be a situation where we need to beep on the new leadership at ISTE to see about getting more of a focus on K-12. And I want to come back and just give a shout out to the folks that are hosting this event because um, Michigan Virtual Learning is now the place where we've got the research going on, we've got the um, publications, and they are, from my perspective, sort of filling the um, gap that we saw um, resulting from INACO going and moving in other directions. So I just wanted to make sure that we said yay for Michigan Virtual Learning. got like what five minutes here Jared do you want to we have things that we need to wrap up on uh, I don't think I have anything to add on on that topic um, I, I okay just wanted to make sure because you got sort of quiet there for a bit <laughs> um, Leanna anything else on wrap up um, I'll just uh, I'll just thank very much MBLRI. I'll echo your statement, um, Ray, and thanking um, everybody there for their support. And I did want to mention that um, as of the new year, um, Catherine's going to be stepping down as co-editor, and Jared will be stepping up. So I look forward to working with Jared uh, as co-editor of the Journal of Online Lending Research in the coming year. Cool. Susan, do you have a wrap? Anything to wrap? No, I don't think so. I'm I'm reading all this stuff about where to go. 
Yeah. <laughs> Michael? Um, the only thing I guess I'd add is, um, and Randy can probably say more to this, um, but um, while INACO claims to be international, let's face it, they are a U.S. organization, but there are international groups that um, are focused on K-12 online and blended learning that don't have the same kind of ideological issues. Um, the Canadian eLearning Network, or Can eLearn, which Randy is the um, CEO for, is one that I would particularly plug, uh, especially since I know that a lot of the um, Michigan Virtual Learning uh, sessions tend to be attended by a number of Canadians. Um, as well, the Canadian Institute for Distance Education Research, or CIDR, which is based out of Athabasca University, um, they tend to have a reasonable uh, K-12 focus, uh, usually one of one or two of their um, eight to ten webinars every year uh, tend to have a K-12 focus and they actually want more, um, they just don't get any more presenters. So for my colleagues that are on the panel, even though you are based in the U.S. and they are based in Canada, uh, really they're just interested in highlighting distance education research at the K-12 level. So I'd strongly encourage you to get in touch with them, and um, you know that's another um, outlet to get the word out. And Ray, oh, thank I think you. Catherine wanted to make a oh. comment. Catherine. Thanks, Leanna. Thanks, Ray. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys for, for being here. Um, I did want to just mention what I mentioned in the chat box about the idea of because we've been going to the conferences such as INACO, OOC, um, and ISTE, and we're not really seeing a strong research focus at um, any of those ones for K-12 specifically, that we're looking into partnering with one, two, or three of these organizations in order to do a one to two day pre-conference ahead of the actual meeting so that there's an opportunity for researchers to be there and as Michael said, just to kind of co-collaborate with the practitioners as well because as Michael said, it does price them out. Um, the practitioners are priced out of most of these conferences. Um, so it's good to, and also the researchers don't feel welcome oftentimes and so we're trying to kind of bridge that gap. Thank you, Catherine. I want to talk with you then about TXDLA. Um, Justin, I turn it back to you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ray, for being um, a really nice host and, and uh, being able to guide the conversation. We really appreciate that. Uh, some really interesting conversations out there, and I'm hoping we can all um, stay in touch and continue to connect uh, with regard to all the issues that we talked about today. Uh, just, again, thank you to our panel, Leanna, Michael, Susan, and Jared, and again to Ray for facilitating. We really appreciate you guys coming and sharing all your stories and your insights. Just a couple housekeeping uh, things here. We want to make mention of our Virtual Viewpoints podcast. Uh, we just released uh, an episode for the first time in a couple months, actually. So we had an episode come out on Tuesday uh, in which we talk with folks from COSIN and the New Media Consortium about their Horizon report. So we get a little bit of um, insight into how that report is produced. Uh, but you can check out all of our podcast episodes at the link there. And if you're interested in coming on and sharing your work, I believe we have at least one podcast guest and Mike, Dr. Michael Barber here in attendance today. So uh, if you're interested in coming on and, and sharing your work with us, uh, we'd be happy to have you uh, do that as well. We also have a guest blogger program uh, where you can actually write a few words about uh, some of the work that you're doing uh, specific to online and blended learning research. So be sure to check that link out there to learn about more of the requirements for that uh, blog initiative as well. And then in the meantime, you can keep in touch with us through email. Our email address is listed there. You can sign up for our mailing list. Follow us on all of our social accounts, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, our YouTube channel is where you'll see all of our recorded webinars, and you will see the recording of this webinar posted within the next 24 hours or so. So we'll be sure to share that out with you as well. And lastly, we just want to, again, send everyone off with uh, some well wishes for the rest of the week. Everyone take care.